Ludumdare 38 marks the anniversary of 15 years of Ludumdare and also set a new record. Never before had so many people participated and published their games. It was also a real stress test for the shiny new website. My first jam was LD32, so I can talk much about history. Just that personally I find it extraordinary that so many people contribute to the medium. In my last documentary I mentioned that I wanted to shake things up a bit. I just did one thing differently this time, but that changed everything that followed. I collaborated. See the struggle, the joy, the sweat and all that pizza that forged our Ludumdare 38 game. 72 hours of peril, polygons and programming. This is the post-mortem of Headroom. To me, Ludum Dare had always been a solo adventure. Just me and the computer and a goal. To make a game in 48 hours. In January I was having coffee with my good friend Max. My wild stories of my Ludum Dare experiences must have piqued his interest. Hey, you wanna team up for the next one? He asked. Sure, said I, and it was settled. Ludum Dare 38 would be a co-op effort. This is Max Merana. He came late to gaming, but has since spent every waking hour catching up and falling in love with From Software's Souls series. Max also happens to be a real programmer, someone who's literally getting paid for coding. It's so weird. It was Max who introduced me to the concept of Git and version control early before the jam, which speaks volumes about our different levels of proficiency. In addition to programming, Max's biggest strength is coming up with lots of different game ideas out of the blue. It's incredible. In Ludum Dare's solo category, you have 48 hours to make a game. Since we would be running in the jam category, we had a full 72 hours to make our game. Not running solo anymore means also new challenges, such as where to jam, data exchange and data safety, scheduling for two people and just who is doing what. We elected my home office as base of operations and Connie donated her desk for Max and his notebook. But also our files needed a place to stay. So I set up a shared folder on a drive on our home server. As a precaution I scheduled a script that would back up the project every three hours to a zip file to a different drive that a potential catastrophe would only set us back three hours at the very most. To complicate things further, Max was working on his MacBook, while my workstation was my beefed up Windows 10 PC. What could go wrong? When two people with different sleeping patterns are supposed to crunch together, there already are concessions to be made. Max could start working at 8 in the morning, whereas I would be best rested after 4 in the afternoon. We met somewhere in the middle having our days start at 10.30ish and Max would leave around 11pm each day. Long before the jam we looked at how to best split our workload. Because Max is a far superior coder, he'd do the programming in Unity. And because I'm a notorious polisher, I'd take care of the art and assets. Concept and game design would happen in collaboration.
Another new thing for me was getting to grips with Unity. I've grown familiar and somewhat comfortable with Game Maker, but the occasional look over the fence at the dazzling world of object-oriented programming in C-Sharp just was too enticing. Game Maker is great for 2D stuff, but building a game experience in 3D is, is much more immersive. The weeks leading up to the jam, I dove right in and started a small test project. A first-person reimagining of my LD37 game, The Cellar. I spent countless hours with playing around, watching tutorials, lurking on Stack Overflow and endlessly refactoring my terrible C-sharp code. Wrapping my head around classes, inheritance and scoping was a bit intimidating in the beginning, but ultimately worth it and great fun. Incidentally, that meant I had more Unity experience than my programmer. Two days before the jam, I visited Max and showed him what I got. Laying bare my hacky code in front of a real programmer was a terrifying experience. At least it brought Max up to speed on how things worked in principle inside Unity. And we primed our stomachs for what to expect that weekend. <laughs> the last step of preparation was scavenging for supplies for the two of us to survive the weekend. Fruit, nuts, drinks, questionable choices in refrigerated pizza, sweets and delicious treats to reward ourselves for milestones reached. The theme's announcement, as always, happened at 3 a.m. local time, with me still wide awake. Once more, I was expectant for one of my preferred themes to win. I had some ideas for two colors, but in general I avoid brainstorming before the announcement because to me that feels a bit like cheating. There must be a joker somewhere at Microsoft following the jam, because like clockwork, a Windows update was ready for download shortly before the announcement. Sure, why not? What's the worst thing that could… oh, right, that. With my workstation trying to recollect itself, I resorted to some mindless gaming, hoping for the storm to pass and refreshing my Twitter timeline. This time the theme was Small World. Funny, because that was the only theme from the final voting round that I dreaded the most. But this time around I wasn't on my own. I fired a quick text message to Max, so he could start churning out ideas as soon as he'd see it. Once I was largely finished with my indulgence in self-pity, I went to work. Kinda. I felt I needed to think in images. My very first idea was the universe as a marble, like in the ending sequence of Men in Black. Then a self-contained miniature village in a book, probably because I had spent some time with Populous recently. All of a sudden my brain tapped into a buried poem and produced the first lines from William Blake's Auguries of Innocence. To see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. World, sand, hour. I had this vision of a desert town in an hourglass and tunnels underneath reminiscent of Simant. Tunnels that would collapse as the sands of time trickled down. I was quite enamored with the premise, there was potential for a great mechanic in there. And how turning the hourglass over would be a mind-blowing twist. I called it a day and hoped for Max to have something even better.
I've brewed myself a big steamy pot of liquid motivation to appear awake enough for Max. In a bout of caffeine lit zeal, I relocated my whiteboard to facilitate some professional agile development. Max arrived shortly after with Annabelle, his girlfriend. As our ladies left for brunch, there was just one thing for us to do. Buckle down and work. Just as I had hoped, Max brought a whole list of ideas with him and we began pitching to each other and put our material on the board. Our top runners were The World Inside the Hourglass, an adventure game set in an ordinary room with the player being tiny, and a racing game with planets. I still was in favor of the hourglass idea, which Max found promising too. There was something great in there, somewhere. We just had to unearth it. Whatever that was, it was just out of reach. We tried all sorts of approaches to extract that one great mechanic, but to no avail. We had to put it aside for the time being and shifted our attention towards the other ideas. Here's us exploring the wacky planet racing game with chocolates. Okay. Three, two, one, race your planet! I still find it funny how billions would scream as the player would use Jupiter's gravity to drift around a galactic corner. <laughs> Aside from that, we knew that it wasn't going anywhere either. Yeah. It's all about not losing your mind in the next 72 hours. Yeah. <laughs> oh. We moved our brainstorming around the apartment. Each idea we picked ran through our fingers like sand the closer we looked. It was frustrating. At 3 pm, we were 12 hours in without a promising concept. This all looked awfully familiar to me. My bad influence must have rubbed off to Max as this time it was him flipping through Simon Stollenhag's book Urwarschel Klotet, desperate for inspiration. We went back to the hourglass idea and kept smashing our heads against it. There must be something in there, God damn it! Even with a lot of emergency pizza, no eureka moment relieved us, from our frustration. Das Thema ist scheiße. <lacht> Nein, das ist nicht das Thema. Sag mal so, was würdest du gerne für ein Spiel machen? Mist. Mist. Ultimately, we accepted that we just had to let it go. With sober eyes, we returned to one of Max's ideas, the survival game set entirely in an ordinary room, with the player being the size of an ant. What I liked about it was that it put the tired old survival mechanics in a new context. Instead of punching trees for wood and hunting boars for food, players would have to scavenge for matches and mine crumbs. It reminded me a bit of Bad Mojo, if anybody remembers that game. This departure finally got the ball rolling and we struck game design gold at last. Instead of just being tiny in a big room, everything would change in size depending on where you went. Passing one door would put you in the same room, albeit smaller. Going the other way around would grow you in size. Seeing all the possibilities, we committed to it. This would be our game. We just had to make it. Could it work? Only one way to find out. I began blocking out a rough room in Unity 
and continued in Maya to mock up a proof of concept of the nesting. While Max picked apart my Unity prototype of the cellar and threw out most of it. After a while, I had a first prototype set up in Maya. It became obvious that the player growing and shrinking was limited by the height of the doorways they had to traverse. So I kept tweaking. We thought we had made good progress on our idea until we realized we had slightly different notions of what the game should be. Thus far I had assumed that the room would keep its size while players grow and shrink, while Max thought of differently sized, nested instances of the interior with the player retaining their scale. In the end we found common ground in the room staying the same and scaling and teleporting the player around. Teleporting hassles aside, that's simpler to implement and way easier to handle in the editor than a fractal nesting of instanced environments. Around 8 pm we came up with a bunch of stubs for puzzles involving changing sizes and an interim floor plan on the board. Max was already running around in my blocky concept room in Unity and could start implementing holding objects. And I tweaked the layout of the walls to prevent players from potentially seeing themselves through either door portal. 10 to 10 we had our second meal mulling over the goal. The game was lacking a win condition. A flaw nearly all my LD games shared. Get big enough to escape, kinda like Alice in Wonderland. You unlock a cupboard and there is a potion inside that lets you grow free, Max suggested. Perfect. Alice in Wonderland was all the art direction I needed for the setting. The log cabin thus became a Victorian interior with floral wallpaper, polished and shiny mahogany panels, dusty bookcases, a little writing desk. Highly motivated I spent the following hour gathering references for the art style as Max grew more comfortable with C Sharp in Unity. Having a dedicated person on the team that focuses entirely on the code was a big relief for me. Don't get me wrong, I really enjoy coding, but now I could completely wallow in sinful polishing without a guilty conscience for sacrificing essential coding time. Max stayed until midnight that day, as I was finishing up the wall segment that would make up our rooms. We agreed to meet at half past 10 the next day and I went back to doing a little more polishing before going to bed. After 24 hours the groundwork of our game was laid and I was getting tired but I was having too much fun to stop. It was long past 3 when I finally did and shambled to bed. Wholly ignoring my own advice to get plenty of sleep, I didn't sleep long. On day two, I made a beeline for what was left of yesterday's coffee and then brewed another pot. Max arrived shortly before 11 for our next session. Max continued adding new features, while I started with the next art assets. A Victorian door frame to go with the wall panels. Then rugs to make the place a bit more homey. In another informal stand-up meeting we finalized the floor layout and how passing through a portal affected the player's world position and rotation. Easy peasy. But suddenly Maya and Unity became recalcitrant up to a worrying degree. Especially Maya got very prone to random crashes, particularly when splitting polygons or moving UVs. Over time it got so bad that I had a shortcut to the crash safe folder to quickly pick up work. 
unless Windows 4 is installed and update out of the blue. Why? At 4 p.m. we had our first lunch break, over which we socialized and talked about our next steps. Crashes aside, everything was coming along nicely. We still had a lot of work ahead, but we couldn't help sharing a positive outlook on the endeavor. Highest priority was having a complete playthrough possible in its barest form first, then we'd add complexity until we'd run out of time. And I ran out of something essential much sooner. The initial idea was to traverse the level and grow and shrink as you'd walk seamlessly through a series of rooms that, surprise, are the same room all over again. Max demonstrated picking up placeholders and using the portals, including scaling the objects with the player. Sometime around this point we also ditched the unlockable cabinet with a drink me potion and opted for a plain old locked exit door. Escape the room is a trope most everybody understands instantly. For the door you'd need a key, naturally. But the key couldn't just be sitting on the floor. We needed something to put it on top. So I busied myself with modeling this little writing desk called a Devonport. I learned a whole lot of new terms for Victorian furniture that day. Darling, did you come across my good trousers? I thought I shoved them onto the chaise long, but apparently I didn't. I've emptied the etagere, I've cantered the Canterbury, I've shifted the chiffonier and persistently picked apart the pesky Pembroke for my mother parking pantaloons. Have you checked the Chippendale, darling? The what now? Three hours later, also the portal cameras were working. You could now see through a door to the other side. Whoa. For this to work, we ended up with having cameras on either side that rendered to the texture of a plane placed in the doorframe on the opposite side. Soon we realized that it was not possible for both of us to have the scene open in Unity at the same time. I was working on the assets in Maya and Photoshop, so Max had priority access to the scene. When it came to shading, I had a local copy of the project where I could tweak the shaders as long as I wanted, place any new assets and add colliders. When I was finished, I made a prefab out of it and exported a Unity asset package for Max to import. Whenever he'd take a break, I'd quickly jump in and fine-tune art and placement on the live project. That's not optimal, but it worked for us. The second key asset we'd be needing was, well, the key. Towards the end of our shift, we compiled a quick priority list for what the game still needed at that time, such as the door to the outside, the outside, ending animation, menu screen, intro text and sound. We added a nice to have list that listed items such as assets for lamps, a cupboard, music, that sort of stuff. The puzzle ideas we had kept got the nicer to have label. We couldn't help but feel pretty good about ourselves. La, 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 la. <laughs> Max went home at 11 and just like the day before, I kept working. I set up the terrain for the outside and populated it with standard Unity assets. Once that was done, I took care of the sounds. I like to do my foley recordings at night because there are no birds, no airplanes and not much traffic noise in the background. With various objects substituting for our heavy key, I recorded dropping them onto the floor, carpet and picking them up. Further different footsteps on wood and carpet, just in case and various locking mechanisms around the apartment. Quick and easy. As a subtle setup for the ending, 
we thought it to be nice to have a painting innocuously depicting the outside world. As soon as I was done fiddling with the terrain, I took a screenshot of it to Photoshop, threw a cheesy filter on and painted some lost details back in. My last duty for that day was the door leading to this outside world. At 5 a.m. the morning dawn tinged the sky navy blue and I was in dire need of as much sleep as I could get. To the noise of the early birds shouting at each other, I went to bed. Three days without enough sleep and it took me half an hour to open both of my eyes and get up. I was grateful that the jam didn't last any longer than it did, because I felt outspent already. Just one more day, one more day. I selected, edited and converted the recorded sounds into assets for Max to put in the game, as if he wasn't occupied enough already. For the sound effects of traversing the portals, I played with speed effects and layering again until it sounded interesting enough. Looking at our list, our game still needed a title. It had to be cool and witty, hint at the mechanics, set the tone, tie the experience to the theme and paint an evocative surreal atmosphere. My first idea was simply Alice and we both knew it sucked. Max proposed Headspace. and without much thought I just blurted out Headroom. probably thinking of Max Headroom. Well, seems like the old Headroom career is taking off. The longer we thought about it, the more we liked it. Headroom, Headroom. Headroom. This is is it this? Headroom? Ich bin dafür. Passt. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those in, <laughs> not in favor say nay. At 12.50 we could take it from the list and I threw together a title card for our game with a name. As you know, I'm a sucker for atmosphere and ambient sound is great for that. Though there were no visible sound sources anywhere in the level, apart from the outside world. Thus, music should cover for that deficit. Something electronic or grand symphonic would not really fit the game's atmosphere. I dusted off my solo strings library and experimented with a chamber quartet at first. I tried different combinations and styles of cello, violin and viola, then piano. Once I had the viola playing marcato steps, shaping both rhythm and melody, everything fell into place from that point on. Surprisingly, just after 90 minutes we could tick off music from our list. What's next? The painting depicting the outside world was lacking a nice frame that went well with the rest of the interior, so back to Maya. Once it was ready, adding more paintings to the scene was just a simple matter of changing textures. I wanted to share my admiration and love for the fairy tale like quality with the realistic lighting in the paintings of John William Waterhouse and especially Edmund Blair Leighton, both being pre Raphaelite painters, so their works fit into the time period of the interior perfectly. Having the key lay in the open on the Devonport with just the wrong size wasn't that interesting of a puzzle, but hey, it worked. We still had time to make it a little more interesting. Max suggested a piece of furniture that you could see under, but not reach under at your starting size. And that was my next task, as Max was debugging colliders and scripting the ending sequence, driven entirely by code. After a bit of research on Google Images, I started modeling. 
it was rather straightforward and I felt pretty confident about my modeling skills at that point. I got cocky and decided to place a bunch of books inside and I dropped the ball there. I did not properly think through how to handle mapping and texturing before I began modeling and that cost me much more time than necessary. Also, the spines look ugly in comparison. Oh, well. Yet all that didn't stop me to slip in some easter eggs on the book covers that are visible. While I was busy with the books, Max had something ready to demonstrate. The essentials were in the game so far, even sounds for throwing and picking up the key. And the ending sequence was largely done. There were just some minor audio bugs. Dieses scheiß Ding will not stop, and selbst wenn ihr dem sagt, outside Atmos, stop, now, stop. Ich weiß warum. Ich weiß warum. Weil dieses scheiß Start Ending Audio in jedem Frame aufrufen. Das heißt, <lacht> das Geile ist, wir haben in jedem einzelnen Frame jetzt gepaust und geplayt und zwar so schnell, dass es sie seamless lernt. <lacht> Throughout, we had problems with our colliders, the key occasionally falling through the floor even. We solved this by adding a big box collider below the floor that would push everything back up what fell through. Not entirely safe, but an improvement at least. Max was determined for us to have everything that was needed for a submission ready as early as possible. That not only meant a functioning build, but also screenshots and the submission copy. Should everything go horribly wrong later, we still had this safe build to submit, provided we knew how to actually submit. Because the whole website was so new, I had to research how to do this. Thankfully, Mike posted a bunch of mini tutorials and they were invaluable. That out of the way, we attempted to build the game for the very first time. In the build setup, there was an empty field for the developer name. Of course, we couldn't tolerate a blank field, and finding a team name was suddenly priority number one. A witty combination of our surnames was almost impossible. The best thing Strahl and Merana can be meshed together is Meranal, which sounds like German for more anal. Yeah. That's why we just went with the initials and proudly called ourselves SM Productions. Nothing ambiguous about that. I said nothing, you perverts! While Max's MacBook took its sweet time building for the first time, I lost it. Suddenly I was terrified that the game would not build then or ever, that we couldn't submit anything at all. Beach Ball of Terror. All I wanted then was to return to what was familiar to me, to what I could control. More polishing. Lighting probes. Nein! <laughs> Quality settings? Wir haben das Spiel nicht gespielt, nicht wirklich. Nein. Ja, yeah, das wäre jetzt wichtiger. It did take more than 10 minutes, but everything was fine. Of course it was. Fast fertig? Yeah. Oh, processing player. Oh, oh. Ich hole die Tampa. With all the assets in the game, I was not too happy with the placeholder text. I wanted something more, quote, melancholic, something to set the tone. With Max debugging, I drafted a couple of suggestions we revised together to put into the game. The goal was to have as little text as necessary to carry as much information as possible. And then suddenly, Max couldn't connect to her server anymore and save the Unity project. It was because the server was busy zipping the gigabytes of texture maps in our project directory to the backup. A few very long minutes passed, until it worked again. Whew, second crisis averted. Our save build was still buggy though. The biggest issue we had was when the player was too small the ending sequence would glitch out, pretty much ruining the ending for players. 
Max's last task was for the door handle to check for the player's size and stay locked when they were too small. As Max was tackling all these issues, I set out to write the description of our submission. Because I was a bit worried that not everyone playing would get our game, I intended to spell out the mechanics, just to be sure. Max, however, was strongly opposed to that and we went back and forth on the issue. In the end, Max made the right call, of course. Finding out what to do and how to do it was part of Hedrum's appeal and most all of our players discovered and understood the mechanics by themselves. The cameras for the portal projections still troubled us, because we intended to make the transition look as seamless as possible. It got hacky when Max hooked up the cameras to the player's height. Yeah, it wasn't perfect, but better than before. 90 minutes before the deadline, Max had fulfilled all his programming duties and I let him go to get some well-earned rest. For me, the final polishing frenzy just started. Tirelessly, I moved the lights and the scene around until it was at least satisfactory. Only then I could bake all reflection maps and light probes. I had fun with all the post effects that give the game that next generation look. Of course I'm talking about this kind of next generation. Well, this is unusual. Yeah, I think I like it. A good deal of time I spent tweaking the portal projection cameras, but never got them to look how I wanted them to behave. My adjustments made them even clip through the ceiling or floor when the player was of a certain height. Close to the deadline, I just kept them how they were. Because it took the game a while to load, I was worried that potential players could terminate the process thinking the game had crashed. To counter this, I added a little loading screen to go in front. Did I mention that I'm all about polishing? As the last seconds of the competition expired, I made a final test run. Everything worked. I only needed to submit it. Which turned out to be a bigger problem than anticipated. The new LD website creaked and moaned under the load of everybody trying to publish their entries. While waiting for the bytes of the website to trickle in, I did what I always do. Make a nice title card. With the site still unresponsive, I had plenty of time to take screenshots, build the game and upload it to my server. After around 40 long minutes, the website had recovered enough for me to finally post and submit Headroom. I was incredibly exhausted, as usual, and my body was aching for rest. But still, another game shipped in time. The feedback we got through voting revealed some interesting shortcomings to us. For one thing, the mouse sensitivity was too high for many players, since on my mouse I could easily adjust it on the fly. The other thing was walking speed. Max and I consciously decided on slowing the player down to discourage them to shrink too much, because there's nothing interesting to encounter, only glitches. But we underestimated that this was the fun aspect, exploring the room from different perspectives, and being slowed down too much and not being able to walk onto the carpets anymore is anything but fun. Then there were the glitches, of course. Naturally players would attempt to throw the key through the portal, often landing it in a spot where they couldn't reach it anymore. Lose the key, lose the game. All in all, I had a blast and am very happy with the result. Sure, there is a certain overhead when collaborating and I can be a bit hard to work with when I'm insisting on my perfectionism in some regards. 
but being able to bounce ideas off other people involved can set an avalanche of interesting follow-ups in motion where it does. So whatever the future may bring, I'm optimistic that somehow I can make a game with any theme. Unless it's obnoxious again! I've emptied the etagere, I've canted the Canterbury, I've shifted the chiffonier, and I even forgot my f***ing text. I've shifted the chiffonier and persistently picked apart that mother parking. Pembroke heißt das Ding. Hieß das immer schon so? Ich hab keine Ahnung. Darling, did you come across per any chance my nochmal Satzstruktur? 